Kabadi. Good afternoon, students, and welcome to the facilitation class. I can't see anybody in here, but I want to believe you will join me soon. We are on the criminal law 342 for this afternoon. I had sent a Zoom uh, link earlier on, but I'm surprised people are not here now. But we will start all the same. Expecting that later you will take it up and go through them. I'm Akujobi Alero, the facilitator for this class. And we shall be looking at uh, topic one under PUL 342. I will start sharing my screen now, so I expect you to please follow. Where you don't have, um, and where you have any question, please bring it up so that we can discuss them. Thank you. In case you're not able to join this class, please check your discussion forum for questions. And along the class, facilitation class, I will give you some activities which I expect you to go and do. Please be serious with them and take it and take them, uh, do them rightly. So then when we come next class, we'll have time to discuss over the questions and make some clarifications where there is any confusion. So let me share my screen now for the class. Yes, are you seeing my screen? I want to believe you are seeing it. So like I said, this is PUL 342. And in this class, we are going to have, um, we are going to be discussing on various topics. Today is topic one. So I will just go generally through the topics which I'll be discussing and also start on uh, offenses against property. Now we shall be looking at offenses against property, property we shall also be looking at offenses against the administration of justice. We shall be looking at uh, offenses against the state. We shall also be looking at different types of punishment under penal theorists. And eventually we shall be looking at sentencing. Uh, along the line, we shall also be looking at uh, um, corruption um, and all forms of corruption and what have you, in order to have a very good understanding of such crimes and how the law, uh, what the law says about them and the punishment so prescribed for them. So like I've always said, criminal law is a very interesting cause. It's a cause that has to do with every aspect of our lives, all our daily activities. Every time, every day, there's one offense being committed one way or the other. And then how the law looks at these offenses, how the law treats these offenses, the punishment prescribed by these offenses and the sentences imposed on them for them is what we're interested in under criminal law. So this, this, this slide you are seeing now is talking about, talk, telling us that this chapter discusses property crimes, including stealing, robbery, demanding with finances, burglary, housebreaking, and I will be looking different at different types of stealing, okay? along the line. So it's important to follow, and it's also important that you pay proper attention, particularly for many of us that have had reasons to always carry over this course. There will be no need for that if you can just be, uh, uh, if you can just be attentive, if you can attend the classes, go through your course materials, and where there are questions, always ask questions. Where you are not uh, clear or where you are confused, always ask questions and you'll be answered. So, which are still in generally, what is it all about? We all know that there are different ways people can steal and that mainly the essence of stealing is protection of the, of the, of the ownership in property. Still, the, 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 the law of stealing or stealing itself is the law of stealing just to protect that ownership one has in property. 
So Celia has tremendous importance to all human adventures, and this necessitates adequate protection through legal machinery. It is therefore not surprising that undue interference with other possession or ownership is often declared punishable under our criminal law. Yet undue interference, undue in the sense that it is interference that one seeks or one gets without the consent of the owner. Interference that is un uncalled for, interference that is unwarranted. You can imagine robbers entering your house in the night just to come and carry away your property. Of course, such interference is not wanted, it's unwelcomed, and it's not uh, anticipated. So to protect you, to protect your property, the law of stealing is, in, uh, is there to help guide against such, uh, such acts. Most property crimes are crimes of theft. Theft is a generic term embracing a wide variety of misconduct by which a person is improperly deprived of his property. That's what we've just said. And the purpose of theft law is to promote security of property by threatening aggressors with punishment. So if such persons are caught, if such persons are, are, are finally uh, 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 caught, of course, they have to face the law. It can be defined as a generic term embracing a wide variety of misconduct when a person is unlawfully deprived of his or her property. Prior to the enactment of the criminal law, the law, common law of larceny was in operation. So before we have the law of theft, of course, what we used to have was the common law of larceny. The old law had been replaced by, in Nigeria by the offense of stealing and in Britain by the offense, by the theft act of 1968. Of course, we can see this clearly in the case of Oshinye and the state. Now, according to section 382 of the criminal code, also in section 286 of the penal code, it defines stealing as every inanimate thing whatsoever, which is the property of any person, and which is, which is movable, is capable of stealing. In other words, Anything that is inanimate, that is, is not animate, it's not, uh, it's not something that you cannot move, something that can be moved from one place to the other. So something like land, of course, you cannot land as it were, you cannot steal land, but of course you can see the documents to land, okay? Because those are movable items, okay? So section 283 um, of the criminal code provides, which is also like I said, section 286, uh, the offense of as a person who fraudulently converts to his own use or to the use of another person. Anything of being capable, anything being capable of being stolen is said to steal that thing. From the section, the element of stealing under the criminal code, of course, includes fraud, taking, or converting anything capable of being stolen to the use of that person or to the use of any other. Person. So we, are, we shall look at this one by one. We've mentioned from the section above that defines stealing. We've seen that one element that will be very clear that is the element of fraud. We have also seen that the element of taking must be there. And of course, conversion too must be there. And we have also seen that it must be something, anything that is capable of stealing. So for instance, if a corpse, for instance, you know, is being stolen, we have to ask ourselves under the law, is that uh, object, is that substance, something that is capable of being stolen? If it is not, and you want to charge the person for stealing, of course, such charge will fail because it will, it's deemed, it will be seen that it is not something that you can steal. If, for instance, you, you things are dumped somewhere, as, as, as it were, in a dustbin, and somebody goes there to pick them up, can you say such a person has stolen those things? Are the things that he has picked up are those things capable of being moved? Are they capable of ownership? Are they capable of being stolen? These are what we are going to look at in order to understand properly what we are talking about. I hope you are following me and understanding at the same time. Now, like I said from the above definition, the element of stealing are one, fraud. The element of fraud will support a charge of stealing under section 383, subsection two, a to F. The six instances makes taking or conversion fraudulent. In other words, when you, have, when you have taken something that does not belong to you, 
without the owner's consent, and without him wanting to know that you have taken it, because that's where the fraudulent element comes in. Of course, you would have been deemed to have taken that, uh, uh, that particular thing. So for another we can see in the case of Pin and Usoba, where the appellant was convicted for stealing the sum of 35,000 Naira by transferring the amount from the account of one company into the account of another by telegram. Of course, he might have done this either by virtue of his position in the company or one thing or the other, but of course, without the approval of his employees, of his employers to have done that, then he would have, he would have been deemed to have stolen uh, that particular thing. Again, the, the, the issue of fraud can come in at times, even when it is offensive, like we shall see later, offenses stealing by false pretenses, stealing by menaces, stealing by all kinds of all kinds of stealing. The important thing there with that fraud element is without the consent of the owner, without uh, the approval of the owner, doing things in a manner that you do not want who owns them to be aware of what you are doing. And of course, moving them from one place to the other, then you would have been deemed to have stolen that item. So we shall look at conversion. So like we said, the element consists of fraud, consists of conversion. So when we are talking of conversion, what are we talking about? Again, the case of Lancashire and Yorkshire, Yorkshire Railway Company and Mark Nicole comes into play. Yet it says, Lord Atkins there says, that conversion means dealing in goods in a manner inconsistent with the right of the true owner. We amount to a conversion, provided it's also an intention on the part of the, perf the, defend the person stealing, the person taking, the defendant in so doing, to deny the owner right or to assent a right which is inconsistent with the owner's right. So you can see the end that, that conversion means, for instance, you take something, you take a a, a, for instance, a, the shirt of somebody that you know that he uses such shirt to go to office or wherever, and you convert it to your, your own use. And even you use such thing, you use it in a manner, you know, it is not even the same way that the person would have used it. Okay. Of course, you are using it in a manner that is inconsistent with its right. You would have been deemed to have stolen that uh, property. So, in all that we have said so far, we have seen that accordingly, therefore, to destroy anything, to alter, to sell, to pledge, to use property belonging to another person, as can be found in section 382, subsection 2A to F, we all be mean to me, we all mean to convert it. So, like I said, that section provides the intent necessary for this offense to, to have taken place. Mind you, the actus reus in this particular offense or the physical act in this particular offense is the movement. Is the taking, okay, the, the, the destruction, the altering, the selling, the pledging. And of course, the menstrual here is the intent, the fraudulent intent, without the consent, without the approval, without the awareness of the owner, to deprive the owner of the use of that particular thing. So the conversion itself must be to the use of the accused or to some other person. Under section 384, subsection 4, in deciding whether a conversion is fraudulent, it is immaterial that the converter had an innocent possession of the property or that he had the power of attorney for his deposition or was authorized uh, to dispose of the property. In other words, even if you buy goods, for instance, for some people that do not know that such goods have been stolen, okay, you buy in a market over, for instance, and of course you do not know that such goods have been stolen. Of course, it will be immaterial that you, you had innocent possession of the goods. Because if eventually the goods were traced, the goods would be returned back to the original owner. So in R and Epeyon, we see a case where A hires a bicycle from B for five months under a written agreement and sold the bicycle to another. Mine is supposed to be a higher purchase agreement. Not a, a not, it was not supposed to have sold the bicycle. So he has dealt with the bicycle in a manner inconsistent with the rights of the owner. He was convicted for stealing, and rightly so, because the sales amounted to fraudulent eh, conversion. I hope you are following and you are also understanding. So we have also seen that that is, um, that is uh, what stealing can also uh, 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 be. Now, 
we're going to look at under the common law, like we said, only tangible property could be subject to stealing. Tangible property is property that has physical form, money, uh, prob uh, clothes, uh, vehicles, and all of that. So these are things that are capable of being touched. They are things capable of being moved in the sense that it can be carried, taken and carried away. Personal property is anything that is of value, that is subject to ownership, that is not land or fixture. Items that are permanently affixed to the land. Crops and minerals are not considered to be personal until severed from the land. Okay, but domestic animals are considered to be tangible personal property. So you can see there that anything that is affixed to the land, as long as it remains affixed to the land, they cannot be deemed to be personal property. They cannot be deemed to be, uh, to, they cannot be deemed to be uh, 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 intangible property. Okay, I mean they cannot be deemed to be tangible property. So until it is, it is removed from the land, it is severed from the land, and it is cut from the land. And you can now say that such property has physical form, can be moved from one place to the other, and as such, they have property that are now capable of being stolen. So if you steal from it and somebody's dog. You go and take somebody's dog. Of course, that is a tangible property. It has physical form. It can be moved from one place to the other. But if somebody's, uh, if somebody has a land in a, in a, in a, in, in a particular area, and then you want to bring a, a child again, I think that person has stolen my land. Such cannot hold because the person cannot be seen to be moving the land from one place to the other. You could bring another allegation against the person. Okay. For uh, uh, for other kinds of offense, but definitely not uh, stealing. So, however, it is not only tangible that can be stolen. We see that in states in in the in, in the state in state and Iowa, the appellants were convicted of stealing the deeds of conveyance conveyance from the registrar of title. So, even if you cannot steal the physical land itself, like I said earlier, the documents. Relating to that land can be can be deemed to be stolen. So you could be you could be asked a question where, for instance, you are told that A stole the land belonging to B, you know, and A has been charged for the offense of stealing. You are told to advise A whether such a stand with uh, whatever will stand. Of course, you should know from the right from the beginning that land is not something that is subject to stealing. But if, on the other hand, you were asked a question that he stole the deeds of conveyance and all of that, that of course is something that is subject and is capable of being stolen. And you can bring up a proper charge against that uh, person for such an uh, offense. So we also see in the case of Moa and the state, where the applicant were convicted of stealing the money that he collected from an insurance company on behalf of his client. He did not pay the money to the client. Of course, he would be deemed to have stolen that particular property. So some of the things that this property must uh, consist of, the property we are talking about of, of, of now of being stolen, is for instance, it must be something that is capable of, that, is, that has value. Does the property have value? Is this property that you can say, yes, this property is, uh, it has value and as such, it's, uh, it's capable of being stolen. Because where you cannot attach value to it, such property cannot be deemed to be stolen. So to, to, to constitute, uh, to, to be something that can constitute stealing, it will be something, it, it will constitute something to steal the subject matter, must be something of value, however slight. So in countries like I said in Kuwait, it is not stealing for instance, it is not criminal for instance to steal something like uh, liquor, alcohol, pork meat, since certain things are regarded as unclean under their laws and are therefore without a value. But you know that in our situation, in, in a place like here, of course, such things will be deemed as a uh, theft because we have we place value on such uh, items. So apart from the thing also having value, such a thing must be something that also has ownership. The thing to be stolen must have an owner. Those in Ar and Vega, in, uh, the accused took abandoned old shade of iron innocently. It was established in setting him free that things of which the ownership has been abandoned are not capable of being stolen. So we can see that this, uh, so the things we are talking about uh, being uh, stolen, apart from the fact that they must be something that are capable of being moved 
from one place to the other. There must be things that also have value, okay? That you can place value on, that are not considered useless, you know, that are not considered necessary. They must also be seen that, uh, that I have ownership. You can say, yes, this thing belongs to this, this thing belongs to this. So that's why I said from that, for instance, things you packed, you dumped in the dustbin. Of course, anybody that goes there to pick, you cannot say that such a person is stealing them or is to taking, removing it because it is, of course, to you, it of course no longer has value. Three, you have, uh, you have, uh, you, you are no longer the owner of such a thing, okay? You have remo removed your own interest from it, about true throwing it away. So in the case of, uh, that, that we can see very well in the case of R and Vegas. Also a case that is necessary for stealing is the case of R and Esom, where Esom picked up a policeman's uh, handbag in a cinema, opened it and wrestled through the content. He then replaced the bag, not taking anything. It was held that in every case of stealing, the appropriation must be accompanied by an intention to, prom to, to permanently deprive uh, an owner of his property so that a conditional appropriation that is appropriation with intent to keep any property will not suffice to convey the appropriation of, to, will not suffice for the offense of stealing. If appeal was allowed. So what we're trying to say here, and to, along the line, we're going to differentiate the offense of stealing from robbery, because we will see that in robbery, there are certain elements that must be present that is not necessary for stealing. Basically, when we're talking about stealing, we're talking about those things that can be moved, those things that you can take fraudulently without the consent of the owner, uh, with malicious intent and all of that. Those things that you also do convert to. So you could even take something with, uh, with the, with, with, with the uh, consent of the owner, and then you put it in a use that is inconsistent with, with, uh, inconsistent with the request of the owner. If, for instance, you've been given a, an amount of money to help buy land and all of that, and you convert the money to use it to help uh, build the house for yourself, of course, you will be deemed to have converted the money to your own use, and you have, would, have been used, you would have used that money in a manner inconsistent with what was expected of you. So such intent falls under section 382, subsection 2, 8, uh, which, you, I, I, which are, is in your criminal code. So it's left for you to go there. Really thoroughly and understand all the intent purposes so that you will know where each particular one will fall into. Now, we also have the case of uh, the case of uh, and the state, where Honorable Jotiniki to be stated as well, that ownership is the vital, is the most vital and indispensable essential or ingredient of the offense of stealing. In other words, anything stolen, for you to say it has been stolen, it must have, somebody must own it. It will be something that is subject to ownership. It is the prop upon which all other essentials or ingredients stand. Because if you don't own it, how will you give consent or not give consent? So you must own it to be able to not, for your consent to have to, for you, for you to be said that you did not give your consent. You must own it for somebody, for you to say that somebody else has converted. So basically, ownership is at the root of stealing. It is the baseline of the offense of stealing. The final accused person could be confused. Of, of the offense of there must be evidence of stealing. The person could be natural or artificial. Here again, if the person could be natural or artificial, the person could be um, a natural person, it could be a company, it could be whatever, but you must be able to establish that these basic things are there and they are, uh, and they are there, and you know, of course they are missing or that they are there. So know that the property must be capable of being stolen and must exist see the case of Nemuni and the state. Also state of, the case of state and Udimayo, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many cases of stealing that you can check out for when reading. You'll find the basic things to look out for these elements, to look out for these um, elements that must be there for, this, for the subject matter. Is this of something of value? Is it consisting of ownership? You know, you must look out for those elements. Is this something that can be moved from one place to the other? Yes or yes, no. So apparently this element must all exist at the same time for it to be a fence of stealing. Where it is not, where you are not able to establish any of this intent, then of course it will cease to be an offense under stealing. 
I want to believe you are following me and that you are also listening to me. Good. So now, let's, before we go to uh, the activity, let's look at the different types of stealing. What are those different types of stealing that we normally hear of? Okay, we hear stealing by tricks. What do you mean by stealing by tricks? Stealing by trick must be distinguishable from stealing by mistake. The distinguishing element is the presence of a fraudulent intent in the former and the absence of a fraudulent uh, intent in the, uh, in the latter. So when you steal by trick, of course, that is with a fraudulent in intent. And when you steal without knowing that what you are doing is stealing, you took uh, uh, two, two of you put your bag together on the table, identical bag, and then you carried a stone without thinking that it was your own. Of course, that's by mistake. Okay, so that, that of course, you cannot say there was a fraudulent intent in the latter. So that's what we mean by that. So we were stealing, stealing by mistake. We are stealing by mistake. The actress is discharged and acquitted. See the state of Agu and state. Because when you can establish that a mistake was, uh, was um, honest, its mistake was uh, not fraudulent, of course. And then its mistake was after the state of things as it were, of course. Because we'll be able to, it will be discharged and acquitted. Then we also have stealing by intimidation at an Edo and Philippi, where the police officer refused to allow the accused on bail because he, he gave him money. Unless he gives him money. Of course, this is, of course, using his office, position of office, to take money from the uh, accused person, which I'll see all of this more, more in details later. This, of course, is stealing by uh, intimidation using position of office to take something from another person. That was caught out stealing by finding. You could be walking along the road, and of course you see something that you know, I, ideally is, you know very well it's not yours, and what, what is expected of you is to make your report of what you have seen to the appropriate authority, but you decided to, to pocket it. Of course, you begin to have stolen by finding. Stealing by clerks and servants, this type of stealing can be likened to embezzlement. Okay, so we should know that it, does not, it cannot be should not be equated to a general deficiency in the account where the individual item can be traced. To succeed under this thing, the prosecutor must prove that the and defender was employed as a clerk or as a servant in this place of work, that the money or property came into his possession for and on behalf of his employer. So we see many many times we see employees running away with employer's money, money that they've been given, for instance, to go and pay into the account, account to the bank to do one thing or the other, but they run away with such money, believing that they will not be caught, believing that, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they believe in that they need the money or whatever. But what is important, so what, this kind of thing, you have to be an employee in, the, in, the, in your place of work, and the money came into your possession on behalf of your employer. And of course, you are diverting it, you are converting it to your own use. Then we also have a situation where uh, it is fraudulently taken or converted, uh, that is subject matter. Like in the case of uh, R and uh, Adewusi and R, you know, where the chairman of a district council received money on behalf of the council and used it for his personal needs. Of course, it can, this, this is the type of thing we are talking about. He was held liable. Also, we see the case of Ayan Diego and, uh, and uh, Aaron Ayan Diego, where the accused moved money from one state to another in the same room. The two states belonged to another office employee. He was not held liable for stealing. We should be able to differentiate this kind of cases. Yes, like I said, the money must be an employee in that particular company. The money must have come into the, uh, it, it must have come into your, of possession for the uh, benefit for, for or on behalf of the employer. So if, for instance, the employer normally keeps it in state B, or you decide to keep it in state A, it all still belongs to the employer. Can such a person be charged for stealing? Of course, the answer would be no, because he's still working for the employer, he's still keeping the money on behalf of the employer, and as such, he cannot be charged for the uh, taking of such uh, uh, money. So we can see that these are various types of stealing, either by tricks, either by mistakes, either by findings, either by intimidation, either using your place of employment for such purposes or however. 
this the 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 law the courts will be able to distinguish the kind of stealing it is and look out for those elements those elements that I said are in section 382, subsection 2A to F of the criminal code, and see whether it falls into any of them. That is why it's relevant, it's important that you understand each of these sections, understand each of these intent, because having understood them, and then having understood how a subject matter can become a, 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 time, a property, or how it can become a subject of stealing, value, no value, ownership, no ownership, then the other element of fraud, conversion, fraudulent take, I mean, uh, the take, moving or the taking itself, this will help you to know properly if such items have been stolen. So having said all of this, I have some activities for you, which I want you to go back and go through them thoroughly and try and answer them. The first one is to discuss the intent under section 382, sorry, the two is not there, a to F of the criminal code relating to stealing with the aid of cases. There's no criminal law textbook you are reading that you will not see this intent specified under section two, uh, under section 382, that any criminal law of Nigeria you are reading, you will see it there. So please go and read and understand this intent I've mentioned, understand what it means to steal, understand the statutory provisions, look for some of the cases that are relevant and apply them and be able to answer that question properly. Then explain the differences between robbery and stealing. Though we have not done robbery, but I want you to understand, you, I want you to go ahead of me, read it and try to make some differentiation. But when we come to this class properly, I'm going to ask you questions on them. I'm going to ask whether you do understand them. And of course, I'm going to ask you to define what you mean by both terms and what is missing, what is in one that is not in the other. By this, we'd have been able to say, yes, you understand the concept of stealing and how it is applied in Nigeria. So we'll end there today in sharing of slides. I will uh, come back to the class. So, um, okay, I have just, uh, I have you here now with me. Peter, hello. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Okay, when did you join me? Sorry, I've been talking, talking, talking. I, I joined from Monset, from immediately you started. Oh, beautiful. beautiful. Please tell your colleagues then to try and join. You know, so that, so that when they write their exam, they'll do well in their exams, okay? So please, they should yes. try and join. Even if you are in your working place, you can quit out time, step out or whatever, and just listen for it. It's not normally more than one hour. In fact, yeah, in 45, 15 minutes, normally we are done. So I just want to encourage them, please, to come around. Let's try and make uh, make, make best of the, uh, the time we have. We just for about eight weeks. In another eight weeks now, we are done, and we are ready for our exams again. So please speak to your colleagues, OK, so that they can join in this class. So have you listened? Were there questions? Do you have any questions to ask me? Uh, not much, but just one question. Yes, please. Talking about, um, we said that it's only tangible item or property that can be stolen. Mm. But when we talk about stealing by intimidation, yes. if, for instance, a policeman forces you to get an information from you before you could be released or whatever, has he stolen anything from you? If, if apart from physical cash, he demands for an information before you could be released. No, we cannot say, well, that it depends on how you place it. Will you say you have stolen the information, you have taken information for you? You can say that he has take, demanded true menaces, you know? It's a different form of uh, taking from you, you know, such thing. even if you cannot put it properly as stealing, but he has he been able to remove, extract such uh, information from you. Of course, at the end of the, was information something that he could have, uh, could have moved from you? Was information something that, that can leave from you to him, yes, it can be. So it, you can also put uh, put him on that, that yes, yeah, that he has uh, taken it from by virtue of his office, okay? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, I understand. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. All right, so please, like I said, I will put next week, Wednesday, we'll likely meet on Thursday, every Thursday, it will be a recurring at time. So, so that we we'll normally start by, uh, I thought we we'll maybe 1.30 or two, but you just look out for the Zoom link. 
Then I will also encourage you people to go to your virtual learning environment, okay? And try and get the get try and get information. Like I've put some activities there. I've put some activities for you people today to under what when we just finish. Now, did you see it? Yes, yes, I saw some of them. Okay, yes, if you go to your virtual learning space too, environment, you see some activities there that I've also put for topic one. If you are able to pass through them all, answer them properly, of course, at the end of the day, you there's no how you will not pass your criminal law class. So I encourage others to join in the class, okay? Okay, right. so that we can have a, can, so that it will be a meaningful time for us all. So thank you very much for being uh, available. And then we'll thank meet next much. week. All right, then. Thank you. Have a blessed day. And you too, God bless you. God bless you.